Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. And I'm here with the second Bob Dylan review. So previously I talked about Bob Dylan's actual debut album, the 1962 record simply titled Bob Dylan, in which he mostly covered, you know, country and blues songs from before his time. But the record that many see as his true debut is the follow-up from 1963, the free wheelin' Bob Dylan. Now, when I looked at the liner notes for this record, I was instantly struck by some oddities. It reads, as Harry Jackson, a cowboy singer and painter, has explained, he's so goddamn real, it's unbelievable. The irrepressible reality of Bob Dylan is a compound of spontaneity, candor, slicing wit, and uncommonly perceptive eye and ear for the way many of us constrict our capacity for living, while few of us don't. It let, goes on to say, the details of Dylan's biography were summarized in notes to his first Columbia album. But to recapitulate briefly, he was born on May 24th, 1941 in Duluth, Minnesota. His experience with adjusting himself to new sights and sounds started early. During his first 19 years, he lived in Gallup, New Mexico, Cheyenne, South Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Phillipsburg, Kansas, Hibbing, Minnesota, where he graduated from high school and Minneapolis, where he spent a relentless six months at the University of Minnesota. Now, according to my brief research, and I don't know how much historical nuance there actually is to this, as far as I know, the only parts of that that were actually true were the Minnesota parts, Dylan having been born in Duluth and briefly studied at the University of Minnesota. However, this idea of him traveling to even more rural and remote parts of America is part of the mythos he was creating for himself as that all-American folk singer. So what fascinates me is this idea of Dylan as a particularly real singer feels like it's kind of a construct that he has made up himself. When I think about Bob Dylan's songs, I don't think of them as confessional, as singing his heart out, because they're so draped in poetry, it's hard to tell when he's talking about himself, when he's talking about something more abstract, or when he's just writing a kind of song because he wants to write a song. At the same time, Free Wheelin' Bob Dylan contains an iconic cover photo. Now, generally, when I think of album covers, I think of two kinds of covers. I think of the boring kinds that are just a photo that shows, here's the artist, here's how pretty or serious or good at their instrument they look. And then there are covers like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band that say, this album is a piece of art. We're not just showing you the artist, we're, show we're using the cover to add to the artistic vision. What's interesting with the Free Wheel and Bob Dylan is that it is neither. Yes, it is just a photograph of Bob Dylan, but it's a photograph of him with his then girlfriend, Suze Rotolo. Suze Rotolo was not a musician on this album, so this is not simply a photo of musicians. This is a photo of Dylan outside of his musical life. It is trying to capture his realness. Now, Suze Rotolo has had mixed feelings about this photo. On the one hand, I think appreciated that she was in an iconic photo. On the other hand, at the time, she quickly got quite annoyed because because she's not a, a musician on this record, all this shows is that she is Dylan's girlfriend and she did not want to be seen as the muse. Suze Rotolo was uh, politically active. Uh, her parents were communists. I think she was a communist as well. And apparently Bob Dylan's turn from just singing a political, I'm sad, call to Jesus kind of folk songs to protest songs, that's largely to her credit. And to what's to Dylan's credit, what speaks to his own genius is how quickly he picked up on that and how quickly he was able to pick up on, on those lessons into writing not just political songs, but some of the greatest folk protest songs of all time. And the most famous of them all is the first song on this record, Blowing in the Wind, which is a straight to the point, beautiful anti-war song. And the one thing I used to think about this song is that it's nice, it's catchy, uh, it's, it's something you can't forget, but it's also kind of vague. And so the truly great protest songs are ones that are about specific wars, ones that have a more specific message. But now I'm not so sure, because if you think about Woody Guthrie, Bob Dylan's idol, other than this land is your land, none of his songs have really stood the test of time. And a big reason for that is that Woody Guthrie was an in the moment political singer. He would write songs to sing on picket lines and be involved in particular political campaigns. And those songs don't resonate through the years. With Blowing in the Wind, Dylan was trying to create timeless metaphors. And the one thing that's kind of interesting here is Bob Dylan is very young when he's making this record. I think he's 22 years old. But I think what, what's most compelling about this song is uh, the sense of why does this stuff keep happening? And I feel like there's a difference for me now as someone in his late 20s as opposed to when I was in my early 20s, where now this song means more to me 
because I used to be more into the Phil Oaks time of let's protest very specific causes, whereas now I'm starting to see things happening in cycles. I'm starting to see people not listening to the protesters. I'm starting to hear the see the same pain happening again and again. And thus, I, I'm beginning to see the resonance of Blowing in the Wind. The next song on the album is Girl from North Country. Listened to by modern listeners, it kind of comes across as the lesser version of Scarborough Fair, which I imagine Bob Dylan is quoting. And when Simon and Garfunkel went on to record that folk song, they, of course, brought it back into the, into the mainstream. I suppose compared to that actual folk song, Scarborough Fair, Girl from North Country is sort of less about semi-mystical gestures and more about straightforward love. Please see if she has a coat so warm and and the our couple on the cover, Bob and Suze, are wearing coats because it's a somewhat chilly day. Next track, we have a more biting protest song. It's called Masters of War. It sounds very similar to the later John Lennon song, Working Class Hero. And because this one is a real bite to it, I think it, it's a stronger song, though both have their problem of being a bit too repetitive. When I looked at the liner notes with, with this one, what stuck out to Dylan is that towards the end, there's a line where he's we're talking to these masters of war and he says, I hope that you die. And he was really surprised because he's not someone who saw himself as having that venom in him. But I guess that speaks to the intensity of what it means to be an anti-war protester feeling so small in the shadow of the military uh, industrial complex. Like Blowing in the Wind, I suppose you could criticize Masters of War for not being as specific a song as, say, Phil Oaks's I'm Not Marching Any War. But because Dylan writes so many lyrics, and if you look at them with an attuned enough eye, you can see some specificity. You've never done nothing but build to destroy. You play with my world like it's your little toy. Put a gun in my hand and you hide from my eyes and then turn and run further when the fast bullets fly. So in its time in the 1960s, you could read the song as a criticism of the draft. You know, the people doing the drafting treat war just like a game, whereas the people being the drafted are the toys. Uh, and this the song also ends up translating well to the modern age. You know, one way that countries have been able to overcome the sort of anti-war turn of the Vietnam era was using more aerial war warfare, more humanless warfare through drones. So it sort of doesn't matter if the vast majority of the population is not down with the war, because if you can fight a vicious war with a minimal amount of actual patriotism, a minimal amount of actual soldiers, it really does make things like a, like a video game. Track number four is Down the Highway. So if you look at the liner notes, this one was inspired by Dylan's sense that real, real authentic blues was about letting your problems out. And all the imitators of blues that he was playing alongside, they were trying to channel a bluesy aesthetic without necessarily having real pain to sing about. Now, is Bob Dylan necessarily talking about real pain here? No, he's, he, it sounds to me like he's very much being a character, but at least he's committing wholeheartedly to that character to try and create that rural pain aesthetic. So there's a, an interesting realization to when he plays his guitar the loudest here, as well as his yodely singing, it creates a real desert scene. And track number five is Bob Dylan's Blues. And this is the first of these songs that brings out, I, I guess, Bob Dylan's kind of humorous side. Side, he opens it with an introduction. Unlike most of the songs nowadays that have been written up in Tin Pan Alley, that's where most of the folk songs come from nowadays. This is a song that wasn't written up there. This was written somewhere down in the United States. So I talked in my recent Neil Young video about how Neil Young didn't view the north of the United States, the big cities, the New York, as the real USA. And so Bob Dylan is kind of saying, most of the folk songs come from the USA, but this song, it comes from the real USA. I, Bob Dylan, am the real USA. And there's also a kind of silliness to saying folk songs are being written in Tin Pan Alley because, of course, the original idea of folk songs is that they are not written. They are songs that have been passed on from generation to generation. Track six is a real classic. It's a hard rain's gonna fall. So the liner notes for this one state that, unlike many of his contemporaries, Dylan wasn't interested in mere political polemic. And this is kind of what I was getting at with my comparison between Dylan and Phil Oaks. On the one hand, it's easy to admire Phil Oaks more because he was taking more solid political positions. If you're really involved in organizing, Phil Oaks is going to speak to you more. But at the same time, Dylan was creating really resonant art by trying to use powerful images. The liner notes describe it as protesting for peace by giving us a string of haunting vi visions. So Dylan said he wrote this song in the throes of the Cuban Missile Crisis thinking he might not get to finish it. So knowing that, it makes the 
the song a lot more scary when we hear it, though. Also knowing Bob Dylan, I wonder, is he adding theatricality here? Did he really write this song thinking he was going to die? The track number seven is called Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. If you've been to open mics, you've probably heard this one. Dylan, by the time he was writing the liner notes for this one, noted that people were already covering his composition. And he, he wants to say that people are misunderstanding it. So the way he hears the song is it's him sort of mumbling to himself. Uh, it should be heard as a sort of to the self, maybe not quite perfect monologue. So track eight is called Bob Dylan's Dream. It's a, a relatively melodic song compared to other things on the record. And it's sort of Bob Dylan reminiscing about old friends as well as traveling across a trunch of country on the train. And on the one hand, you know, it's a song that I could very much believe writing in my early 20s. You know, we go through groups of friendships so much in our lives, especially if you're moving far away like Dylan did. But he, of course, also has to add a bit of that Dylan myth by framing it as you know, being on a train journey, by sitting by old wooden stoves with hats hung, it creates an aesthetic of a, a few decades before he was actually recording this. So track number nine is called Oxford Town. So for those who want their protest songs with a bit of specificity, this is the song that's like that. And there may be a reason that this one was different than the other songs on the record. Apparently it was written for a contest by Broadside Magazine. Uh, it was about the fact that James Meredith, a Black student, was admitted into the University of Mississippi, and there were all these white protests about it and surrounding violence, though. James Meredith, luckily, is, is alive to this day, and the song ends with a nice little glib ending. Two men died neat the Mississippi moon, somebody better investigate soon. Track number 10 is called Talkin' World War Three Blues. Despite the title, this one feels more down to earth compared to the other apocalyptic track, A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Down at the corner by a hot dog stand, I seen a man and said, howdy, friend, I guess there's just two. He screamed a bit and away he flew, thought I was a communist. So th this one, it's not necessarily about fear of World War, World War III. It's sort of more about the broader political climate and taking it in stride. Track number 11 is a, is a classic folk or blues cover, Karina Karina. This one done with a, a bit more of a full band, like in Don't Think Twice, So That's All Right. Track number 12, Honey, Just Allow Me One More Chance. Uh, this is one that Dylan said he heard recorded by a blue singer whose name he could only remember to be Henry. Uh, apparently it was a guy named Henry Thomas who was recording in the 1890s. And track 13 is I Shall Be Free. This was apparently one of a couple songs on the album recorded in an off the cuff kind of way. Uh, and kind of like talking World War III, it's sort of glibly referencing political and cultural record references of the time. It ends, I'll catch dinosaurs, make love to Elizabeth Taylor, catch hell from Richard Burton. So what's fascinating to me is both the original Bob Dylan album from 1962 and the Free Will and Bob Dylan album are just Bob Dylan with his guitar. Yet slight differences in the inspiration rhythm make a huge difference to the sound. You could actually argue that the original Bob Dylan album is more consistently catchier, I suppose, because he's picking the hits of various artists and their songs that aren't too wordy. They're songs that allow themselves to have a bit of oomph for mournfulness. Whereas by the time Bob Dylan has moved on to the freewheel and Bob Dylan, he's found his wordiness and he's writing profound poems like a hard rain's gonna fall. So overall, the 1962 album might actually be a little stronger in terms of pure sound. But if you're looking for Bob Dylan, the personality for some strain of realness, though, how much realness, who knows? You know, Bob Dylan wasn't necessarily even comfortable being a political singer. He was perhaps really inspired, again, by Suze Rotolo, which is maybe why it makes sense that she's on the cover, because Bob Dylan might not have been a protest singer at heart, but he had enough in his heart to be inspired by this true woman of protest to write some songs because of his relationship and friendship with her. His album has three absolutely classic songs on it, in Blowing in the Wind, Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, and A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall some Dylan doing goofy improv. It's certainly the start of a fascinating musical era. Uh, and that's why I think it's pretty important to listen to. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig Bompi. See you next time. Mm -hmm.